Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, March 15th, 2022. I'm delighted to be back with Professor David Anderson. David, it's great to be with you again. Good to see you. Good to see you too, David. First, David, congratulations, literally hot off the press, the publication of Nature of the Beast. Tell oh. me about that. Tell me how that project came about and what you hope to accomplish in reaching a broad audience. Um, well, I had uh, uh, wanted to uh, write a book for the general public for a long time. And because uh, I think I'm, I've been told I'm pretty good at making complicated concepts accessible to non-scientists. And uh, I hadn't really had an opportunity to do that, although I, I had written a book proposal well over a decade ago and sample chapters, and uh, uh, I just never got around to it. And then uh, uh, several, two things happened really that uh, made this possible. The first is that uh, Ralph Adolphs and I collaborated together on what was my first book or half book, uh, which is called The Neuroscience of Emotion, A New Synthesis, uh, which was published in 2018 by Princeton University Press. And that was uh, a book aimed at an academic audience, at our colleagues, at graduate students, postdocs, maybe even some undergraduates to uh, try to explain uh, to them our, uh, our emerging view of how one could integrate the study of emotions in humans and in animals. Um, and, and so that was the, the first uh, exercise and it forced me to assemble my thoughts about all of this. Um, and then uh, in, I think it was 2018, um, through fortuitous events, I met a, uh, um, a uh, literary agent who handles books for scientists. And uh, she became interested in uh, helping me publish a book aimed at a general audience. And uh, so given that I had an agent to represent me, she walked me through the process of writing a book proposal uh, back and forth uh, and then helped me find a publisher. And I, I don't think that uh, without, I think without her help, um, there's no way that somebody would have uh, 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 agreed to publish uh, a manuscript from me. Um, most, most of the people, most of the publishers that she uh, uh, sent the book to passed on it. Uh, there were only two that were interested and the first one was Princeton. And I, I decided the second one was Basic Books, which is not a mass market publisher, but they are what's known as a trade publisher. And um, I decided to go with Basic because I thought that they would do uh, a better job with marketing as indeed they have in comparison to, uh, uh, to Princeton. Um, so, so that's sort of the process uh, that as it unfolded. And <clears throat> in terms of the content and why I felt it was um, an, an, an appropriate time to speak out, uh, there, there's been um, a sort of upheaval in the emotion field over the last, I would say now, t starting 10 years ago, uh, but really sort of peaking in around 2017 um, with uh, several, one noted emotion researcher, Joseph Ledoux, who's at NYU, um, in particular, uh, essentially, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, sorry, I'm not uh, disavowing his previous 30 years of research on the role of the amygdala in fear in rats on which he built an international reputation and on which he published a number of popular books himself 
such as the emotional brain and the synaptic self. And uh, starting in 2012, Ledoux reversed position and said that what he was studying in rodents was not emotion. It was simply defensive behavior and that <clears throat> uh, we should reserve the word emotion for uh, <coughs> discussing um, subjective feelings, conscious feelings. And since only humans are, uh, are humans are the only animals that we know experience conscious feelings. We have no objective way to know that in animals. It doesn't exclude the possibility, but we just have no way of knowing it. Um, it follows from that, that if we say that we're studying emotions, we should really, we should only be working on people. Essentially, uh, um, uh, uh, essentially uh, saying that studies of emotion in animals are at least conceptually uh, um, off limits to neuroscientists. And, uh, and then subsequently in 2017, uh, a book was published by, and, and he, he detailed this in, in some other books he published. And then in 2017, a book was published by a psychologist at uh, uh, Northeastern University uh, named Lisa Feldman Barrett called How Emotions Are Made. And <clears throat> she had hired a publicist and she got a lot of attention for this book. And she presented this book as a new quote unquote theory of emotion. And in this book, she argued that the idea, not only that human, that emotions are a unique attribute of humans or something we can only really study in humans, but also <clears throat> that there was there were no um, fixed regions of the brain that control specific emotions. That rather emotions are something that were made up on the fly by our, by our brains every time we experienced an emotion and that the pattern of activity in the brain during two different episodes of what we might label anger were, were completely unrelated to each other and that the whole representation of emotions was very dynamic and flexible and it was wrong to try to identify regions in the brain uh, that, uh, that control emotion. And this, again, flying in the face of <clears throat> decades of work uh, done uh, by people, including Ralph Adolphs, my colleague, um, showing that uh, in humans, the amygdala is at the very least necessary for the subjective experience of fear. Um, and, and lots of other uh, data on that as well. And she published um, several, in addition to her book, she published several several influential op-eds in the New York Times, in, in the first of which she argued that the amygdala, activity in the, the amygdala uh, that has nothing to do with emotion and is not a neural signature of fear. And in the second one, she, uh, uh, she published an, an op-ed on anger saying that uh, uh, there is no such thing as anger, that anger is so diverse that you can't pinpoint a pattern of activity that is relevant to anger. So um, this, this book uh, got a lot of attention, sold a lot of copies, despite the fact that I can't really understand what she's saying and neither can Ralph. And Ralph works on humans and Ralph is a very smart guy. And if Ralph can't understand what Lisa is saying, I don't see how I can understand what she's saying. And um, uh, and Lisa and Ralph engaged in all kinds of public debates about this back and forth and back and forth. So I, I decided since many people in the emotion field were very disturbed by uh, Ledoux's volt -Fass, and uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett's position, um, and and the implication, which is you know potentially far-reaching, that one can't or at least shouldn't study emotion 
in animals, uh, at least defining emotion using the colloquial meaning as feelings, that it was important to uh, uh, to uh, delineate alternative point of view. And I come at this as a biologist and as a neuroscientist, not as a psychologist. And like Darwin, uh, I think that emotions are biological functions of the brain and therefore that they have appeared through phylogeny as a result of natural selection, just like any other brain function and that um, they didn't just pop up uh, in humans. But I agree that we can't study subjective feelings in animals, because in order to determine whether an animal has subjective feelings, you need to ask it, how do you feel? And the only measure of subjective feeling is verbal report, and humans are the only creatures capable of verbal report. So it follows from that that we can't uh, uh, assess subjective feelings in uh, animals that can't talk, and no animal can talk except for us. So um, you might think that if feelings equal emotion and we can't study feelings in animals, there's nothing left to study about emotion in animals. And that's, that's where uh, I think I part ways with uh, Feldman, Barrett, and Ledoux, and that, that I see emotion as analogous to a huge iceberg. And the conscious feeling part of emotion is just the tip that you can see above the ocean. And there is a whole lot of other things going on in the brain that give rise in humans to those conscious feelings. And maybe you're maybe not in animals. And that's the part of the iceberg under the surface. And that's the part that we have in common with animals. And that's the part that we should be able to study in animals. So uh, if, if you accept that premise, it requires two things. One is that you have to be uh, willing to accept a scientific redefinition of emotion, not as conscious feelings, but as a function that the brain performs, like learning and memory, decision-making, sensation, perception, action, et cetera. Uh, and the second thing is that you need a way to distinguish whether a particular behavior that an animal exhibits is uh, reflects an internal emotion state. So I, I forgot to say the obvious uh, as usual, which is that we conceptualize emotions as internal brain states, meaning they're patterns of electrical and chemical activity in the brain that are both can be triggered by sensory stimuli or by our own memories or experiences, and that in turn influence the way we respond to other stimuli behaviorally. And, and so they're an internal processing step. And it's sort of like if you think about an old fashioned telephone switchboard with operators plugging and unplugging cables, uh, the, the emotion state is the manager who's directing which cables to be plugged in and unplugged as information flows through the brain and gets relayed out to behavior, uh, behavior systems. And, and so the, the critical problem in, in animals is how to identify instances of behavior that are not simply reflexive and automatic. And that's important because we can if we just look at animals, we are very tempted to project our own anthropocentric feelings or anthropomorphic feelings onto them. And we can easily be fooled into thinking that an animal is exhibiting uh, an emotional behavior when in fact, it's just a sort of robotic reflex. And the clearest demonstration of this was by a um, MIT cyberneticist named Valentino Breitenberg, who published a little uh, a little book booklet uh, 
called Vehicles in the 1980s, which I highly recommend. And he showed that uh, you could wire up very simple vehicles that consisted only of sensors that detected things like light, wheels, and motors driving the wheels that were connected to the sensors. And depending which wheels the sensors were connected to, in other words, did the left sensor, this, you think of this as a rectangular box, did the left sensor at the front of the box connect to the left wheel or the right wheel? In other words, did the wires cross or were they parallel? And was the effect of stimulating the sensor to speed the wheel up or to slow the wheel down that you could get uh, you could build robots that could be attracted to a light and then stop. They could avoid a light or they could move towards light and run past that. And sort of in a playful trolling of psychologists, he labeled the robot that approached the light and stopped as showing love, the robot that avoided the light as showing fear, and the robot that approached the light and ran over it as, as showing aggressiveness. Um, and, and so when I first started thinking about this problem and this book was brought to my attention, I realized that this was a serious problem and, and, and <clears throat> one that prevents you from identifying instances of emotional expression without some sort of criteria, objective criteria. Because, I mean, if you watch a Star Wars movie, you can easily be fooled into thinking that a robot that's basically a tin can with a dome on top and wheels has emotions. Um, and in fact, uh, we can easily be fooled into thinking that certain people have emotions by how they behave when they don't really have those emotions. And if they're really good at that, then tens of thousands of people come to watch them do it. We pay them millions of dollars. They're called actors. So uh, uh, it becomes from a scientific <laughs> standpoint, it becomes necessary to develop some sort of criteria to distinguish uh, reflex behaviors from behaviors that reflect an internal emotional state. And that's where Ralph and I came up with this concept of what we call emotion primitives. These are their building blocks of emotion states. They're properties of both emotional behavior and also of the circuits that give rise to emotional behavior. This is a conjecture that distinguish those behaviors from automatic reflexes. So I'll give you two examples. One is persistence. So reflex behaviors like when you jerk your leg out and the doctor taps your knee with his little hammer are time locked to the stimulus onset and offset. Whereas emotions often tend to outlast by minutes or tens of minutes, the stimulus that evoked them. So you're hiking on a trail in the San Gabriels, you hear a rattle of a rattlesnake in the bushes, you jump in the air, and then even for minutes after the snake slithers off into the bushes, your heart is still pounding, your mouth is dry, your palms are sweaty, and if you see anything on the ground that looks even remotely snake-like, you're gonna stop or you're gonna jump in the air or you're going to avoid it. Uh, and so persistence is that that long duration uh, uh, tail of the, uh, uh, of, of the behavior and the internal state are, are one, is one kind of emotion primitive. Another one is what we call scalability, uh, not in the engineering sense of being able to scale up production of something uh, it, it, to a large extent, but in the sense of escalation. Emotion states tend to escalate in their intensity in a way that behaviors do not, uh, that reflexes do not. Reflexes, again, they're all or none. You either show them or you don't show them. Whereas in a state of unhappiness, you can escalate from sniffling to sobbing to wailing, or in a state of aggressiveness, you can escalate from threats to physical aggression. And in a state of fear, you can escalate from avoidance to freezing towards to panicked escape. And, and this is a problem actually that uh, Dean Mobs, a Caltech professor in HSS, and working on in humans. And, and, and so there's, there's a, a set of about 
six or seven of these emotion primitives that Ralph and I uh, uh, could think of in uh, that we discuss in the 2018 book and that we, we actually proposed this originally in a um, perspective piece that I wrote for Cell with Ralph in 2014. And the point is, this is not a theory of emotion. It is a way of thinking about emotion and deconstructing it in a manner that you now can study it in animals and ask questions that you wouldn't previously have thought about asking. How is a persistent emotion state encoded by the brain? Given that neurons fire on a time scale of milliseconds, how can the nervous system continue to generate activity in response to a brief stimulus that lasts for tens of minutes? And scalability, well, what is escalating? when you know a state of aggressiveness is escalating is it the level of activity in some neurons is it the number of neurons is it which neurons that are being active is it some chemical that's being released into the brain we don't know anything about this and so the concept of emotion primitives is that they are building blocks of emotion uh, in the same way that a carburetor and a transmission and an internal combustion engine are building blocks of an automobile. And that makes them useful in an evolutionary sense, just as humans had to invent wheels and axles and internal combustion engine before they could invent an automobile. Evolution, we think, had to involve invent these properties such as persistence and scalability, valence, is another one, generalizability, uh, in order uh, for animals to become more flexible in their behavior and progress a collection of hardwired reflexes into uh, behaviors that express internal states, which give the animal much more flexibility in how it's going to respond to a particular situation. And that view, in turn, if it's true or a way of testing is to look in contemporary animals of different species and we work it mainly in fruit flies and mice to see if we can see evidence of any of these emotion primitives not only in mice but also in fruit flies when they exhibit behaviors that in humans are associated with internal emotion states like fighting or mating or fleeing from a threat. And uh, part of the reason for doing that is to try to understand how evolutionarily ancient these emotion primitives are when they first appeared in evolution. And another reason is that studying a neural process in flies allows you to investigate its causal and mechanistic basis with a degree of precision that is not possible in mice. Uh, for a variety of reasons, which I can get into. Um, and so that's also uh, a, a very important reason for trying to study these uh, internal states um, in different organisms. And in fact, that's why we started working on the jellyfish originally, because um, I, I reason that, look, if you, if you want to see if there is an animal on the planet, a contemporary animal species that really does work like a Breitenberg vehicle, it's just a series of pre-programmed pre reflexes, probably your best bet would be to look at a jellyfish because they don't even have a brain. So is it possible that uh, uh, a jellyfish could display at least some emotion primitives uh, like scalability and persistence in its behavior. So, so to be clear, the fact that we can observe evidence of emotion primitives in an animal's behavior doesn't mean that we're saying that that animal has full-blown emotions in the way that we have them. It means that they have components uh, that we can study uh, using causal neuroscience. And that's critical because if we can only study emotions in humans, then we can only study them primarily using brain scanning techniques, which are non-invasive. And brain scanning techniques only reveal correlations between patterns of brain activity and emotion, and therefore they can't distinguish cause and effect. If you see a pattern of brain activity that is 
correlated in, in the amygdala that's correlated with a verbal report of fear. You don't know to know if the brain activity is causing the fear or the fear is causing the brain activity or some other thing that you're not even measuring in another region of the brain is causing both the fear and the amygdala activity and they have nothing to do with each other. And the only way to distinguish cause and effect is to perturb the brain to turn neurons on and turn neurons off and alter their levels of activity in specific region, re, regions of the brain and at specific times and ask how that influences the animal's response to a stimulus that elicits emotion-like behaviors or that shows emotion primitives. And we can't do those experiments in humans because they're not medically justifiable and they are not technically possible at this point. And so that means that if we restrict ourselves to studying emotions in humans, we'll never have a causal understanding of the relationship between the brain and emotions as we have for other brain functions like decision-making and cognition and learning and memory and perception and all of the other wonderful things our brains do. And I'm, I'm just not ready to relegate emotion to a slag heap of mysterious brain functions that cannot be studied in animals and therefore are off limits to uh, causal neuroscience. So that was a long winded answer to your question of why and what. Uh, David, David, in conveying these ideas to a popular audience to break yeah. out of the traditional academic yeah. arguments, and in light of the fact that, you know, with a popular book, there's always the possibility that these very complex ideas get boiled down into sound bites. What, what are your goals in terms of the national conversation, perhaps even the public policy implications of the ideas that you're conveying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that's this is what I'm terrified of, um, and uh, 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 in fact, the the uh, um, the uh, uh, things things are are starting. I have a, on this. I have the national conversation, as you put it, started. I have a essay coming out um, next Sunday in the Wall Street Journal, and I have an interview with NPR about this tomorrow. Um, and and so. The, the goals are, first of all, to um, emphasize to people that it's really important, first of all, that emotions are biological functions of the brain and that they evolved, which means that they're present in animals, at least in some form, as well as in us, and that there's more to emotion than just subjective conscious feeling, and that we have to be able to objectively identify instances of emotional expression in animals so that we can study it in animals using causal neuroscience. Because if we don't do that, we're never going to develop new and improved medications for mental illnesses. And part of the reason that psychiatry has lagged so far behind other disciplines in the development of medications is that the psychiatric disorders are defined by their symptoms, not by their causes. And so there's nothing in our understanding of psychiatric disorders that, that helps us better develop a medicine for the mind. It would be like uh, defining COVID as a runny nose and scratchy throat and a bunch of other symptoms, including a loss of a sense of smell without knowing that it's caused by a virus. And that would make it in fact very different, difficult since not everybody with COVID loses their sense of smell or taste. There could be a whole bunch of different causative agents and viruses that are lumped in that rubric of, uh, of cold-like symptoms. In fact, it sometimes can be, even now, can be difficult for people who get mild COVID to know if they have COVID or a head cold. So if we don't know what causes a disease, a disorder, how can we rationally develop a medicine to treat it uh, in the way that once we learn that diabetes 
was caused by an insufficiency of insulin, we realized that we could treat diabetics by giving them more insulin. And that kind of causal knowledge will never emerge in the brain without studies of emotions in animals. So I want people to get that and to understand it and to, to let go of the idea that emotions are, that, that feelings are the sine qua non of emotions. They're, they're a part of emotion. And they're the part that right now can only be studied in humans, but there are a lot of other parts of emotion that are not conscious feelings can study in animals. And there's even evidence in humans that uh, for unconscious emotion in humans in some uh, uh, research uh, projects and papers that have been done. So, so that's, that's the, the, that's the uh, issue. And it's, it's as, as I'm sure you appreciate, it treads a very thin line because the temptation is to boil this down to a sound bite, which is like, you know, even fruit flies have feelings. And the last thing that I want to have happen as a result of this is for all the people in my lab who work on fruit flies to have to spend hours and hours and hours writing animal protocols to the Office of Laboratory Animal Resources <laughs> to allow them to do an experiment in fruit flies like they do when they want to do an experiment in a vertebrate animal, like mice. Right. You know, even though there is no rational, objective reason for concluding that mice have feelings and flies don't, there's no evidence for that, the fact is that public policy is based on the assumption that there is a difference and that vertebrate animals have feelings that invertebrate animals don't. And so if it gets distorted into that, then I've done my colleagues a huge disservice and I should be taken out and shot. <laughs> David, one more topical question before yeah. we go back to the to the to your personal narrative. We're all watching the unfolding horror in Ukraine right now. Yep. If we boil all of that down, your expertise, your deep thinking and the emotions at the heart of neuroscience, and we look at war basically as an emotional breakdown, hatred, tribalism, confusion, mm -hmm. the takeaway, obviously, war is so primitive. It's so animal-like. Long term... What might your research, the, the research that's happening more broadly at the Chen Institute, what might that have on a quote-unquote translational impact of understanding and maybe even preventing war in the future? Yeah, that's a, that's a very difficult question. The short answer is I can't say. Uh, I would love to uh, discover some drug that we could... Uh, spray out of a crop duster airplane as it flew across a battlefield and that instantly pacified all the combatants so they would throw down their weapons. Uh, I don't see that uh, happening anytime soon. On the other hand, brains have a lot of mechanisms to keep aggression in check. There's no question about that. And so the more that we learn about uh, how brains keep aggression in check, uh, the better position will be to think about how that might feed in to uh, aggression in the context of complex social interactions. But I, I don't want to pretend that neuroscience is the solution to all problems of violence and aggression. There's many other disciplines that are important that have to come into the discussion, psychology, social psychology, sociology, uh, historical factors, and all of those sorts of things. But um, I mean, the fact is that there there is widespread thinking, for example, that a hormone called oxytocin uh, in, increases trust. And there's even a popular book uh, um, published calling ox, which is called the love hormone about oxytocin. And uh, we don't really know how it works and whether and how it functions to inhibit aggression. Um, we don't know how when an animal fights, uh, when an animal is mating, it shuts down its aggressive instincts. And these are things that we're trying to study in the lab because these are powerful 
natural mechanisms for keeping aggression in check. Uh, and that's the best I can say. The analogy I would make is that uh, if we want to develop cures for cancer, since cancer is a disease of uncontrolled cell division, we need to understand how cells divide. And if we can do that in a yeast cell more powerfully than we can do that in a human cell, so much the better. And indeed, most of the Nobel, Pri the Nobel Prizes that have been awarded for work on cell division have been awarded for work done in yeast, not in mammalian cells, let alone human cells. So, so that's sort of the way I think about the, the potential translational, uh, uh, um, the translational aspects of aggression research. But even that is a really fraught topic because there are people that feel that if you are able to, particularly if you're able to identify biological predispositions to violence, that that will be used to marginalize certain people and uh, change how they're treated so that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It may be used to, in an inappropriate way, to uh, damp down uh, uh, the behavior of people who may be more spirited and volatile than others. And so if we, it's like any technology, if we, if we learn the science and we propose to translate it, we have to be very, very careful that that knowledge is used in an ethical manner and uh, not abused. David, of course, it's an obviously intense topic of speculation right now. I assume you haven't thought about this much, but just shooting from the hip, when you look at Putin and his decision making, what do you see that can help us explain his motivations and more importantly, the underlying emotions that drive those motivations? That I, I, I really can't answer that question. That, that's, that's, that's like asking a psychiatrist or a psychologist to make a diagnosis from a distance. And not only am I not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, uh, even psychiatrists have a strong ethical code about not diagnosing uh, uh, psychiatric disorders in politicians just by observing their behavior. This is called the Goldwater rule because it came out at the time of Barry Goldwater's presidency. And it was something that was vigorously debated during the Trump presidency, you know, is he crazy or is he not? Um, so I, I, I can't offer any uh, professional um, interpretation of of Putin's behavior. I can I can offer you know a lay person's analysis of what he's doing, um, and if I had to categorize his behavior as a type of aggression. So there's many different, and this is something I do know a little bit about. There's different types of aggression. There's offensive aggression, sometimes uh, referred to as appetitive aggression. Uh, there is defensive aggression, and there is predatory aggression. And the, the emotion states that underlie those different forms of aggression are different. Professional soldiers fight because they're paid to, not because they're mad at the enemy. And, and so uh, I would say the type of aggression that is motivating Putin is a type of predatory aggression or, or territorial aggression and a type of offensive aggression. Um, but that's, that's really all that I can say. And it, it is so deeply embedded in, in a cognitive calculus that he has. It's really uh, the, any, any sort of uh, uh, effort to explain it in terms of animalistic tendencies would at best fall short of the mark uh, and at worst be completely misplaced. I mean, my own personal view is that he wants to try to reconstitute the original Soviet Union, and this is the first step, and it'll be followed by annexation of all other former Soviet satellite countries that are not in NATO. And then once he's done that, he maybe will take a little, put his toe in the water and try to annex a small NATO country like Romania and see whether the West is willing to put up a fight or not. But that, that's, that's a 
lay opinion. It's not a uh, not informed by any knowledge of neuroscience. Well, let's go back to the 1980s. A question I've been looking forward to asking you since our last conversation yeah. to close the thread on Rockefeller University. Of course, famous, famously, Rockefeller had no system of cultivating junior faculty, right? It's senior faculty and their enor enormous fiefdoms no. of laboratories. From your perspective as a graduate student, what yeah. were the advantages and disadvantages of that system? Um, from my perspective as a graduate student, um, I mean, to compare it to Caltech, where obviously there is a wonderful culture of promoting junior scholars. Right. So so the first thing I have to say is that that's not true anymore at Rockefeller. Right. Largely as the result of efforts by David Baltimore when he was the president of Rockefeller. The, thankless, so the thankless efforts yes, at the time. The thankless efforts. And, and so Rockefeller now I see is very much operates in the same mold as Caltech does in trying to promote its uh, uh, independent junior faculty into tenured faculty positions. Um, I, I didn't really experience any benefit of that system uh, in the lab that I worked in because at the time uh, that lab, Gunter Blobel's lab, was actually run in a very horizontal manner. All he had was postdocs and graduate students. He did not have assistant professors and associate professors within his group, uh, like uh, Gerald Edelman, who was a Nobel laureate and another professor at Caltech did. Um, you know, I can speculate that maybe one advantage of that type of structure is that it affords the latter structures that affords long-term continuity of uh, 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 domain knowledge and expertise and technical knowledge that can more easily be passed on to each successive generation of students and postdocs that come into the lab. Uh, if you don't have that, basically you rely on students and postdocs training each other as they come through the laboratory and you have no long-term sort of repository uh, of, uh, of technical expertise. And so there, there, are, there are things that my lab used to know how to do. And right now there's nobody in my lab who knows how to do them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really unfortunate, but uh, that, that, that sort of uh, a pyramidal system, the Max Planck type system, can help. Also, the other thing that Max Planck system that can help with that is uh, having long-term dedicated uh, professional staff scientists, either at the PhD level or at the not uh, the the uh, uh, pre-PhD level, to maintain that continuity uh, of technical competence. But I I didn't sense really any benefit to me uh, of that uh, being in Gunter's lab as a student. What advice did you get, if any, about thinking for your next opportunity after you defended the thesis? That's a really good question, um, because my thesis was at the interface between cell biology and neuroscience. Right. I was applying some of the tools uh, that were developed in Gunter's lab to understand basic cell biological functions to understanding proteins in the nervous system. And in fact, uh, my advisor used to denigrate my research as quote unquote, he said, neurobiology, that's just applied cell biology. One of these days you have to do something fundamental. It sharpens your thinking. And in a sense he was right, um, but uh, that put me in a position that when I defended my thesis, I really faced a fork in the road, which was, do I continue in cell biology and maybe switch to working on something more quote unquote fundamental, meaning a process that happens in all cells, not just in neurons, um, or do I take the path into neuroscience and the emerging area of uh, using tools from cell biology and molecular biology to try to understand the brain, as opposed to just electrodes and electrophysiology and electrical engineering, 
And I had a very, I recall a very important phone call in which I discussed this with a, uh, a senior professor uh, from the, who is, I guess, at, was at Yale or at the Salk Institute named Charles Stevens. He was a Chuck Stevens. He was a, a physicist turned uh, uh, neuroscientist. And I had gotten to know him at various meetings that I had attended and presented my work. I was very fortunate parenthetically, to get a lot of exposure to people in the field as a graduate student because my advisor really didn't care about the research that I was doing, but it did have an impact in neuroscience. And so when we published our papers, he started getting lots of in invitations to go to neuroscience meetings. And since he had utterly no interest in neuroscience, he sent me. So there, there I was, this young Pisher without even a PhD, uh, mixing with hot shots at meetings and presenting my research. Anyhow, Chuck Stevens gave, I, I asked him point blank this question. I had an opportunity to work with somebody uh, that was focused on sort of the next frontier in basic cell biology or to head more into neuroscience. And Chuck said, you need to stay with neuroscience. That's where things are going to be. That's where it's going to be at. The excitement is going to be over the next decade. So uh, he gave me that advice and it was definitely against the advice that I got from my advisor. Um, uh, I have a whole book of quotations from my PhD advisor who unfortunately passed away several years ago, but he had a, he had a fairly heavy German accent and he was this Teutonic Wagnerian figure with a shock of white hair and a florid complexion, almost like a Siegfried type of character. And uh, he would constantly uh, uh, reproach me every time I mentioned going into neuroscience and say, David, you have to come back to the Catholic Church of cell biology. <laughs> so he sort of viewed me as an, uh, as an apostate uh, of, uh, of, of cell biology. But really, that was the one important piece of advice that, that I got. And I'm glad I followed that advice. Not that there hasn't been a lot of things important in cell biology, but I don't think I had as much to contribute personally, given the kind of scientist that I am, to cell biology as I did to neuroscience. To so the that I contributed anything to neuroscience. Institutionally, or what labs, what was available to you where this interdisciplinary approach was celebrated where you would feel at home? There were very few places that were doing it at this time. And one of the main places that was, was Columbia. Because uh, um, Columbia had uh, uh, two people uh, who would both eventually go on to win Nobel Prizes who were uh, collaborating with each other. One was Eric Kandel who is famous for his work on learning and memory and won a Nobel Prize for it, and who was sort of the, the czar of neuroscience at uh, Columbia. And the other was Richard Axel, who became my postdoctoral advisor, who was a young Turk, uh, brash, brilliant, somewhat abrasive guy from molecular biology, who thought more crisply and deeply about problems in neuroscience than I, most neuroscience scientists did. And Richard and uh, Eric had gotten together to collaborate uh, in trying to apply molecular biology to neuroscience. And there were other places where some of this was happening, but nowhere that was uh, where the mix was as exciting as at Columbia. And so that's what eventually uh, attracted me to Richard's lab. In fact, um, uh, parenthetical story, Eric was so, uh, uh, was so desperate to get people in this field at Columbia, this emerging field of molecular neuroscience, as they called it, that he tried to recruit me as an assistant professor right out of graduate school. And his idea, since I really didn't know anything about how to do molecular biology. I was a cell biologist. I was not a gene cloner. I had never touched DNA in my entire PhD career. Um, he wanted to get me trained as a molecular biologist. So Eric introduced me to Richard uh, with the idea that Richard was gonna train me 
to be a molecular biologist. And then after that training, Eric would hire me into, Eric almost had a Max Planck-like fiefdom at, uh, at Columbia. Uh, so that's how I got to meet uh, Richard and, uh, and, and then things just developed in action. And I, I did get a job offer at Columbia, but I decided uh, for better or for worse to go to Caltech instead. And so that was the trajectory. What was Richard like? Well, as I said, he, he so Richard was, so he's about uh, uh, nine years older than me. So when I came to his lab, that was 1983. So I was what, 27. So he was 36. Uh, he had just invented uh, a tech, he and his postdoc, Michael Wiggler, had just invented a technique for introducing foreign DNA to animal cells, which turned out to become a foundational technique for the biotechnology industry uh, uh, called transformation and was already famous for that. He'd been elected, I think he was one of the youngest people ever elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And as I said, he was, he was brash, he was brilliant, he was a, a, uh, a New York Jewish street kid from Brooklyn, and he took no prisoners and had no patience for anybody with sloppy thinking and, uh, was uh, brutally critical um, and was challenging to work for, but he really became my lifelong mentor and he still is. How did your research slot into what the lab was doing overall at Columbia? So uh, I started out on a project that Richard suggested that was in the main line of the work that was being done in collaboration with Eric Kendall. In fact, I spent the first nine months there doing most of my, spending a lot of time in Eric Kendall's lab, cutting up these sea slugs that he worked on, Aplesia, Californica, um, and uh, taking out neurons and trying to find gene markers for different kinds of neurons to see how, ge how genetically different they were from each other. And this is something that I've been doing up until the present day. And the, there's an entire field devoted to doing that using much more sophisticated techniques than were available in 1983. Um, so initially that was really a, uh, uh, it was in the main line of what Richard was doing, but for a variety of reasons, I mean, the project succeeded, but in a way that was not very interesting and that was in direct competition with one of Richard's former postdocs who had just gone on to start his own laboratory at Stanford. And I didn't feel like working on a project that was in head to head competition. So at some point I went into Richard and I said, look, I spent the first nine months here working on one of your ideas. Uh, it's not really going very well. I'd like to work on one of my ideas. And so that's when I started the project that became the basis of my first 20 years in research, but that really was tangential to the main thrust of what was going on in Richard's lab. And it was about studying the development of the nervous system and identifying stem cells and progenitor cells uh, and molecular markers for developing neurons um, and uh, using some of what I learned in the first part of the process. So I guess, uh, in, in both um, Richard's lab and in Gunter's lab, my work was tangential to the main thrust of what was going on in the lab. And that's why I sometimes tell people that my claim to fame is that I made little or no contribution to the work of not one, but two Nobel Prize winners <laughs> during my time <laughs> here. <in> my... <laughs> David, what was the intellectual spark that set you on this 20-year path they're, they're found for? What was the intellectual spark? Um, I think it was 
uh, the the my early exposure to um, work by a, a brilliant uh, French embryologist named Nicole Douarin, who should have won a Nobel Prize, but didn't, who mapped the development of a part of the nervous system called the developing nervous system called the neural crest, which is something that my colleague Marianne Bronner has devoted her entire scientific career to working on. Unlike me, she didn't jump ship and switch fields uh, halfway through her career. And I was fascinated by that this small population of cells that sort of detaches from the top of the developing spinal cord and migrates through the embryo, almost like parachutists, parachute troops dropping out of a transport plane as it's flying over a landscape. These cells crawl all over the embryo and they give rise to all the different neurons in the peripheral nervous system, the associated glia, sorry, that's my cat howling, um, the, uh, uh, as well as the bones of the face, blood vessels in the heart, and uh, 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 all kinds. Come on, I'm here. This is my emotional cat, Serafina, who's a star in my book. Come on. Um, she's deaf, so she can't hear me. Uh, anyhow, I was just fascinated by how you could generate all this diversity from such a small initial population of precursors. And I'd always been interested in developmental biology. And the burning question in this field uh, was whether these different cell types arose from subsets of neural crest cells that you couldn't tell apart by eye, but that were already intrinsically different from each other. As, as, as in the case in the parachute analogy, where each parachutist that jumps out of the plane already knows what they're supposed to do before they hit the ground. Or was it the case that those cells were relatively undifferentiated and they only figured out supposed to differentiate into and how they were supposed to develop after they got to where they were migrating. And by analogy, that would be all the parachutists that jumped out of the plane were exactly the same. And they had no idea what they were going to wind up doing in the war until after they hit the ground and looked around and fell, figured out where they were. And, and so uh, the answer, of course, is everything in biology is that it's a mixture of both. And my lab was the first to show that there are some cells in that population that are multipotential and self-renewing and can give rise to at least two different kinds of cells, neurons and glia. And so they're stem cells in the nervous system. And that was a big deal because uh, people were not really thinking about the developing nervous system in terms of stem cells at that time which was in the late 1980s, um, they were uh, thinking about neural development in other ways. But I was strongly influenced by work that was done on the blood system, uh, largely from work of my colleague at Caltech, Paul Patterson, who's now deceased, who was interested in uh, the parallels between the uh, immune system and the nervous system. And so, I, but mainly in terms of the molecules they used. But I sort of pushed that in the direction of thinking about the patterns of, uh, of the developmental trajectories that cells take. But on the other hand, uh, Marianne Bronner has been uh, at the forefront of showing that there are indeed different subpopulations of neurons in the neural crest before they even migrate that constrain uh, what those cells are able to do. So there, there, I would say there are, the, the transport plane has several different, whatever you want to call them, squadrons or platoons of paratroopers that are supposed to do different things and they know sort of different categories of things before they land. Like one is supposed to set up artillery and the other one is supposed to do uh, 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 combat missions on foot. But within those squadrons or platoons, there's still a lot of room for diversification, depending on where the soldiers land when they hit the ground. Push what, that crude analogy. When it was time to go on the job market, 
why not stay at Columbia? Why was that not a consideration for you? Um, because I felt like I would be forever overshadowed by Eric and Richard. And Eric in particular had a very dominant influence uh, on uh, um, uh, the younger faculty uh, at Columbia, including uh, roping them in to uh, helping to write chapters for the massive textbook that he and his colleague Jimmy Schwartz uh, started publishing back in the 80s called Principles of Neural Science, which is, has been the main neuroscience textbook in medical schools for generations. And I already have been roped as a postdoc into working on one of these chapters for this book. And I knew from that experience that if I stayed at Columbia, I was gonna be asked by Eric to do a lot more work on the book. And that was gonna interfere with my ability to do my science. And I guess I really wanted the freedom to explore and decide what I wanted to do without Eric looking over my shoulder and Richard nudging me. I have to say that it, it was it was a decision that I questioned many times in retrospect. In fact, you know, in my first year or two uh, after coming to Caltech, I don't know whether it was homesickness or just missing the style of science at Columbia, I really wanted to go back. Hmm. And uh, in fact, over the last 30 years, I've had two or three opportunities to go back to Columbia, one of which I even signed on the dotted line uh, and back in the, when was this? This was like 1996. Uh, I really felt like I was ready to go. Um, and then for personal reasons, including uh, what my wife was doing at the time, um, it just seemed like the wrong idea in retrospect to go back to New York. And maybe that was a mistake. Maybe it wasn't. But uh, it was very difficult because the style of science at Caltech was and is very different from the style uh, at Columbia. Now, was there a point of contact at Caltech? Were you recruited by somebody specifically? Yeah, I was. I was recruited by Seymour Benzer. Uh -huh. Seymour was the chair of the search committee that recruited me and Seymour, I remember this vividly, Seymour sort of buttonholed me at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting uh, after I had given my talk and very, and this was before I was applying for jobs and very uh, uh, pointedly asked me, you know, what were my plans and was I applying for jobs and, uh, that sort of thing. In fact, I, very, very unusual experience uh, with my job searches uh, in that people, people started asking me, even right after I'd started my postdoc, before I'd published anything from my postdoc, if I was interested in a job in their institution, because this was a hot area and I was just in the right place at the right time. Um, and, and because I had taken some initial steps in that direction, which in retrospect were not particularly profound. But um, anyhow, uh, I had people coming after me and I sort of felt like I was forced into uh, making a decision before I wanted to. So I took a job at Caltech, but then I just continued my postdoc for another couple of years because I wanted to get something done as a postdoc. So Seymour really dug his claws into me and he figured out all of the things that I was interested in. He just he called me relentlessly when he took, he's a, he was an ex-New Yorker also. He grew up in Ben, Brooklyn, and he knew my trepidation about moving from New York City to the wasteland of Southern California, which <laughs> I sort of viewed as just a, a uh, endless uh, desert of, of, uh, of shimmering asphalt and gas stations with uh, no public transportation and uh, no culture 
Uh, and so Seymour uh, uh, took me around when I came out to visit in his 1962 Dodge Dart convertible to various places in downtown LA to show me that there was an urban life there. And uh, he really uh, he really whipped up a lot of support uh, for hiring me at Caltech. And I think in the end that had a, a lot to do, three things had a lot to do with the reason uh, for, for choosing Caltech. One was that the enormous amount of enthusiasm that not just Seymour, but lots of his colleagues showed for recruiting me to Caltech. Um, the second was that uh, as somebody that had crossed over into neuroscience from cell and molecular biology, I, and who was working on a developmental problem, I didn't really feel like a sort of ca card carrying neuroscientist. And it was very important for me to maintain close intellectual and personal contact with people in cell and molecular biology who were not neuroscientists. Mm -hmm. For example, Richard, the lab where I did my postdoc, Richard's in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics at Columbia. He's not in the Department of Neuroscience. And every job offer that I had, except the Cal Caltech job offer, was in a neuroscience department. And I felt that those departments, except for one other one at, sorry, at UC San Francisco, but I felt that a job in the neuroscience department was not going to be a good idea because I would be intellectually isolated. It would be too parochial. And Caltech didn't have a neuroscience department. It All it had was the division of biology. And everybody who did anything biological, all the way from studying cell division and DNA replication to studying uh, motor control in monkeys, were all in the same division. And I found that very attractive, that there were no barriers to interacting with people. Uh, uh, for example, very two of my closest colleagues in the early days when I was at Caltech were Barbara Wold and Ellen Rothenberg, who worked on the development of muscle and the development of the immune system. And my work had much more in common with what they were doing, as well as uh, uh, with the late Eric Davidson than it did with what other neuroscientists at Caltech were doing, except for, except for Paul Patterson. So that was reason number two. And then reason number three was because my father, who was a theoretical physicist, had of course knew about Caltech. And from the perspective of a physicist, he knew what a famous place it was. And so he really thought I should go to Caltech. Um, and you know, whether that was the right advice or not, uh, or because uh, I say this with all uh, respect to my colleagues in biology at Caltech, but I think by any objective criteria, the Caltech biology department, while division, while it's highly competitive with its peer institutions, places like uh, um, MIT, uh, and Harvard, it, it does not enjoy the sort of singular reputation that Caltech's physics and Caltech chemistry and Caltech, Caltech I should say, also geology um, enjoy, where they're widely considered to be the best or one of the two best places to go to study those topics. Um, biology is different, although the history of biology at Caltech is extremely illustrious from T.H. Morgan to George Beadle to Max Delbrook to Seymour Benzer to Roger Sperry. Uh, it, it's, it has a very illustrious history, but somehow that hasn't translated into the kind of, uh, of recognition, at least among young graduate student applicants, I think that physics, chemistry, and geology have had. Obviously, Seymour Benzer had designs in his insistence in recruiting you. Did you have a sense yourself in your early interactions with him that this would precipitate a revolution in your own research agenda? No, I really didn't. Uh, I mean, Seymour worked on fruit flies. Um, I, I, what I will say is that 
from the beginning of working on development, I had tremendous fly envy. In fact, in fact, <laughs> if I if I if I look critically at my choice of organisms in my career path, rather than studying development in mice and rats only, and then switching to behavior and studying behavior in fruit flies and mice and rats, I would have been smarter to study development in fruit flies and then switch to studying behavior in mice and rats in retrospect. Uh, because I think that, uh, and this is certainly true in hindsight, that studying genes that control development in fruit flies had much more general applicability or provided, afforded a more direct way to break into mammalian development than studying neural circuits in fruit flies provides as a way to break into studying mammalian brain function. Um, so that's another, uh, um, I hadn't really thought about that before, but I had fly, anyway, I had fly envy. Uh, Seymour was the god of fly neuroscience, or I would say, I think of him more as the Yoda of, uh, of, of fly neuroscience. And um, uh, eventually uh, I did uh, switch. And um, uh, I think it was, a, in retrospect, it was a good decision. But I have to tell you, I don't, did I tell you the story about my uh, collaboration with Seymour when I first switched into fruit fly neuroscience? Mm, I don't think so. This is great. So Seymour was constantly nudging me, when are you going to see the light? When are you going to see the light? Meaning, when are you going to realize that you should work on fruit flies instead? And I resisted this while I was studying development um, because I was an assistant professor and the thought of taking on a whole new organism was too intimidating. But once I switched into behavior, I made such a radical change in fields that to add another organism didn't seem like such a big deal since I was basically, you know, on the brink of committing professional suicide anyway, who cared if I, you know, tied a weight to my ankle and in addition to a rope around my neck as I jumped off the, the Brooklyn Bridge. And, and so I recruited somebody to start working on fruit flies in my lab. I was fortunate enough to do that. And uh, when he got to my lab, I wanted to, the project was to follow up on an anecdotal observation that Seymour had told me about, which you might have interpreted as evidence of quote unquote, fear in flies. That is Seymour had found that if you put flies in a tube, a confined space and shot them so that they ran out of that tube. And then you gave a fresh cohort of flies the opportunity to choose between the tube that had previously held the shocked flies and a fresh tube, they would always go into the fresh tube and avoid the tube that had contained the shocked flies as if the shocked flies had left some residue or smell of fear in the tube. And I thought that was a really interesting way of starting to get at the question of fear and flies. That is, if you want to know whether flies are afraid of things, you should ask other flies. Uh, and that was a uh, a, a way to do that. So this postdoc came to my lab and I called up Seymour and I asked him if he wanted to collaborate on this because after all, it was his observation. He had recruited me to Caltech. I finally saw the light. I was working on flies and I called up Seymour and asked him if he wanted to collaborate, expecting him to say, great. He said, no. And I was just flabbergasted. I said, what do you mean? He said, no. And, um, uh, I, I, I spoke to a, uh, uh, a former postdoc of Seymour's, Larry Zapersky, who is at UCLA and has been my very close friend and colleague for the last 40 years. And he said, told me, don't take it personally. He says, Seymour hates to collaborate. Seymour doesn't want to be constrained in anything that he does by what anyone else thinks or is doing. He just hates, he's a loner. He hates to collaborate. So I was very depressed, but all right, okay. That's the way it was. So unbeknownst to me and Seymour, 
my postdoc, despite this rejection, went into the Seymour's lab at night and collaborated with a postdoc of Seymour's, a French woman, and to see if they could replicate Seymour's anecdotal observation. And they could, it worked spectacularly. And they showed Seymour the data the next morning and they showed me the data. And then I get a call from Seymour and he says to me, well, I guess we're in bed together. <laughs> because having seen the data and seen the result, there was no way Seymour was gonna let go of that. Right. And in fact, to the contrary, he basically recruited my fly postdoc into his laboratory. My fly postdoc spent most of his time as a postdoc in Seymour's lab, which was great for Seymour because I was footing the bill for the postdoc. So it was a, uh, uh, it was a classic Seymour maneuver. And so that's how, that's how uh, the first paper uh, that had Seymour and me and also Richard Axel, who became involved in the collaboration for other reasons came out. It was a, it was a nature paper published in 2004 on which uh, Richard Seymour and I were the, uh, the three senior co-investigators. It came out the same month that, or sorry, it came out just before Richard received his Nobel Prize in 2004. And I was, uh, they were, they were, I was very grateful that Seymour and Richard allowed me to be the senior author on the paper, because I was at a stage at a career where that made a difference. And it didn't make a difference to Seymour and Richard because they were so well known. But the fact is, that uh, you know, all of us contributed the same or contributed the least. And so in the end of the paper where there is, you have to, in nature, you have to have a author contribution section, which says who did what. And, um, uh, and so you say, which postdocs did which experiment. And then it says DA, SB and RA David Anderson, Seymour Benzer, Benzer, and Richard Axel made equally minimal contributions to this paper. And that's in, that's in print. <laughs> and originally, believe it or not, originally when I sent it in, I wanted, and this was by mutual agreement with Richard and Seymour, we wanted it to say, these three Jews made equally minimal contributions <laughs> to this paper. <laughs> but nature would not let us Nature would not let us put that in, so, but it does say DA, RA, and SB made equally minimal contributions to this paper. And I figured no one would ever see it, but uh, about five years ago, I was at a scientific meeting and a uh, there was a talk given by a professor from UC San Francisco who was one of Seymour's first postdocs in his fly behavior phase. And he put up a slide at the end of his talk when he was giving the credit slide and talking about you know, his role in the project. And he put up that quote from our paper. And he said, I think, I think all PIs should have a statement like this at the end of their paper, that they made uh, uh, minimal contributions to the work described in the paper. So that was, uh, that was very gratifying. David, in the way that for your father as a physicist, Caltech yeah. obviously loomed very large. For you, before you met Seymour Benzer, coming up in biology, did you have an appreciation of Caltech biology, even if it didn't have the same status or stature as physics did? Uh, you know, I, I was well aware of the important work that had been done in biology by people who were at Caltech. This is something you learn about even in your, you know, advanced placement biology course in high school. Thomas Hunt Morgan's work on gene mapping in Drosophila, George Beadle's work on the uh, one gene, one enzyme hypothesis for which they uh, each won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Max Delbrook's work on using uh, bacteriophage uh, to map genes and understand uh, uh, gene control, um, and I, I knew of Seymour's work on fruit fly behavior. In fact, I, I think I still have a copy, I had a copy of his 1967 Scientific American 
article where he wrote about how you could measure behavior in fruit flies. And he talked about fruit flies as atoms of behavior, as he called them. But what I don't recall was knowing that that work was done at Caltech. That is, it was associated in my, in my mind with the people, but it wasn't, but I have to say in fairness, none of the basic biology that I learned about uh, was associated with a particular institution. It was associated with the people that did the work. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there were some very famous experiments done at Caltech uh, during what's called the golden age of molecular biology, um, even by people that didn't win a Nobel Prize, but maybe should have. So the famous so-called messelson stahl experiment that was done by Matthew Messelson and Frank Stahl, where they used uh, ultra, ultra centrifugation, it was basically biophysical chemistry and heavy isotope labeling to show that when DNA replicated, it replicated what's called semi-conservatively. That is, if you imagine the DNA double helix as having a Watson and a Crick strand, uh, instead of at the time of cell division, each of those strands being copied into two new strands, which went into one daughter cell, and then the two original strands went in the other daughter. Each strand was copied, and so the cell separated into each daughter having one of the original template strands and the other strand being a copy of that strand. So one daughter gets the original Watson strand, the other one gets the original Crick strand, plus a copy of the Watson strand or a copy of the Crick strand. That experiment was done at Caltech. And as a result of that technology, also uh, 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 Stahl and uh, uh, Messelson uh, and Francois Jacob and Sidney Brenner uh, discovered messenger RNA at Caltech, but they did the first experiment that provided evidence of solid experimental evidence of messenger RNA, even though people like Francis Crick had speculated for a long time that uh, messenger RNA did exist. So I think it was, it was more maybe after I came to Caltech that I became more aware of its rich history in biology. And maybe that's just because I hadn't really read that much history of science in biology other than uh, Horace Freeland Judson's classic book, The Eighth Day of Creation. Um, so so that's, uh, that's really, it was, I knew about the people, I just didn't know about the place. David, what about this joke that you told me in our first discussion that Caltech is such a quantitative place that biology is almost a humanities discipline? Did, yes. Was that a reputation that you appreciated before you came or only afterwards? It was really only after I came. Uh -huh. In fact, in fact, I actually had, I was teaching a, a introductory biology course, elective biology course for non-biologists in my first seven or eight years at Caltech. And I remember sitting, uh, I was having a lunch or dinner with one of my students uh, at in the in the Rathskeller at the Athenaeum, and I think it was a she asked me, "Why did you come to Caltech if you're interested in biology?" Right. It's like, why would a biologist want to come to Caltech? Caltech is about physics, astrophysics, particle physics, theoretical physics, engineering, math. Uh, uh, why would you, why would you come to Cal? It has no, in other words, the implication also is it has no reputation in biology. And that, I think that showed me the amount of ignorance that even Caltech undergraduates had at the time of the rich history uh, of biology at Caltech. And I, I don't know if you know this, but it wasn't until I think maybe 15 between 15 and 20 years ago, or 10 and 15 years ago, I can't remember, that uh, a, an introductory course in biology, a one quarter course, became a core requirement for all Caltech undergraduates. So at the time that I came to Caltech, 
every undergraduate had to take two full years of math and physics. That is six quarters of math and physics and physics up through quantum mechanics and waves and differential equations and linear algebra, kind of like the Greek and Latin of Caltech, but it was, it was possible and common for a Caltech student to graduate with an undergraduate degree in science and not know that DNA was a double helix or maybe not even know what DNA was. And, and, and it took a huge amount of fighting at the, uh, at the faculty level to shoehorn in even one quarter of a introductory biology course because it's a zero sum game the number of quarters of required courses. And so if you're gonna add a new required course, something's gotta give and something had to give in the six quarter required physics and math curriculum. And I forget exactly what it was. And then eventually they relaxed the institute wide requirement for two full years of math and physics. And they, they, they reduced the number of quarters that all students have to take, but then they left it to the individual majors to determine whether the students had to go on uh, and take quantum mechanics and waves. So I guess, you know, if you're foolish enough to cal come to Caltech to be an undergraduate economics major, now you don't have to take quantum mechanics. I can't imagine that quantum mechanics is a required course for a degree in economics here, <laughs> but uh, uh, who knows, it, it, it could be, but that's, um, and I just encounter this constantly, this this view that um, that sort of biology is an enumerate science that is all about description and memorization, and there's no concepts, principles, and no uh, quantification in biology, which uh, couldn't be further from the truth. David, last question for today: When you got to Caltech. Lee Hood was at the height of his laboratory powers. His, his group had gotten enormous. He had fully embraced all of these engineering marvels. And famously, he got pushback from that, starting with Murph Goldberger, who admonished him to focus on small science, because that's the kind of science that we do at Caltech. I see. I didn't know that. Did, so obviously, that did not register with you at the time. No, although we were, I was well aware, as was everybody else, how enormous Lee Hood's lab was. I think at some point it had over a hundred people in it. And there was a, there was a joke that went around. Uh, maybe it was apocryphal, maybe it's true. And in this story, Lee Hood is walking through his lab and he sees somebody at a microscope that he doesn't recognize. He walks over to the person and he says, look, you know, I want you to know that just because I haven't spoken with you in a while, it doesn't mean that I'm not interested in your project and I'm really excited about your research and what you're doing and we need to get together and have a meeting soon. And the guy looks at him with this puzzled expression, turns out it was a microscope repairman. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> His embrace of, you know, the coming biotechnology revolution you know really yeah. bringing genetics to the forefront did that was that on your radar at the time did that seem like a promising avenue of research that would one day be relevant to you um i i thought so uh and certainly the background that i came from cell biology and molecular biology benefited from that enormously um, and so I could see that, and you know, that was one of the things that attracted me to Caltech, that there was all this technology develop, being developed for microsequencing of proteins in particular, although I didn't have a uh, reason to take advantage of it when I was in, in the early phases uh, of my research. But uh, I certainly thought it was exciting, but at the same time, I was sort of intimidated uh, and a little put off by this huge machine uh, of, uh, uh, that Lee Hood had in his lab. In fact, not only did Lee not dis recognize this person as a microscope repairman, I, I remember going to a conference in Colorado uh, within about a year after I arrived at Caltech and seeing Lee there and saying hi to him and having Lee look at me like he had no idea who I was. And 
you know, I think that's actually, I now know there's actually a neurological condition. Um, and I think Pamela Bjorkman <clears throat> told me she has this too, that people are only, a, some people are only able to recognize the faces of people they know in certain contexts. And outside of that context, they can't recognize the person because the memory of the face is inextricably glued to the memory of the context. So, you know, Lee ignored me and didn't recognize me at the meeting in Colorado. And two weeks later, I ran into him at a meeting at Kirkhoff lecture room and he was all, hi, how are you doing? Nice to see you. He clearly recognized me there, but he didn't recognize me at a meeting in Colorado. <laughs> well, David, on that note, we'll pick up from 1986 going forward for next time.